We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. All right, so good morning again. I didn't introduce myself properly the first time and uh, so I apologize for that. My name's Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor and one of the, uh, the, my favorite parts of the job of, of, of the role I get to serve in is opening up God's Word on this stage most Sundays and being able to show and teach some of the things that God is showing me. One of the best parts about this job is the, the week leading up to and, and writing and preparing for a message because as God is revealing things to me, I get an opportunity to, in, in a fresh way, reveal those things and maybe highlight some of those things for the, the body that, that gathers here. But, you know, one of the things I've learned, in, not just in Scripture, but in general, would you all agree that we love stories where good overcomes evil? Have we noticed that? It's pretty much in, in every storyline in some way, there's always a story where good overcomes evil. In fact, what I've learned is if you watch a movie and good it doesn't win, guess what? There's going to be a sequel, right? It just means there's going to be another one. And if good hasn't beat out yet after the second one, then there's going to be another one. Eventually, right, the story goes on until good overcomes evil. And what we're going to do today is we're going to cover a lot of ground in Scripture. If you'd open up in your Bible to Exodus chapter 5, we're going to go all the way from Exodus 5 all the way through 14. It's a lot of ground to cover. Um, so I'm not going to be able to go verse by verse. You're going to have to, to follow up on some of these things on your own at home. Maybe you've already read this, these passages this week. But ultimately what you're going to hear today is an, an epic story of good overcoming evil. And if we like those kind of stories, you're going to really enjoy reading Exodus 5 through 14 on your own. But I'm going to help us walk through these passages and understand a few things. So if you remember last week, it ended with Moses was told to go speak to Pharaoh, right? Moses was told, go to see Pharaoh, take your brother Aaron with you, and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And here it is, Exodus 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 1. It says, after this presentation to, the, to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went to speak to Pharaoh and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. So Moses and Aaron do exactly what they're asked to do. They're, they go to Pharaoh and they say, God wants you to let us go. Have you ever heard the phrase, it never hurts to ask? Have you heard that? That's kind of a rule I live by. Sometimes there's a situation going on where I know like there's just no way I'm gonna get in, I'm gonna get extra tickets to this sold out thing. There's no way I'm gonna be able to whatever. There's no way they're gonna let me up to the front of this line. There's no way. But the rule is, right, it never hurts to ask. In fact, my rule is it never hurts to ask nicely. In fact, the nicer you can get, the sweeter, you know, you get the little right, right, right eyes. And sometimes you just get what you ask for. But in this one situation, you find out that rule is a total bogus rule. Because what happens is Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, hey, you know, it never hurts to ask. Uh, you, God wants you to let us go. And it does hurt to ask in this case. Because what Pharaoh does, instead of saying yes, or instead of saying no, he says no, no, and in fact, because you asked, I'm going to in, increase the labor output of the Israelite people. Because you asked, it's now going to hurt even more to be a servant under my regime. So Pharaoh says no, he makes life even harder. And that's where we get to the, the what I want to do with this passage is really show you in chapters 5 through 14, what I would call is kind of a study of the human condition. We're going to see something that's true, not only for the, the, the people mentioned in this story, but it's something that's true for each of us in this room. It's just kind of the way it works. If you are a human in this room, you're going to recognize a lot of things 
uh, you're going to recognize that all these things are similar to the way we operate, right? A study of the human condition. And really, if you think about it, a study of the human condition is really just another way of saying an epic battle between good and evil. That's a study of the human condition. It's a, it's a messed up people and a really good God and kind of our, 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 our working towards something better, a good conclusion. And that's what we're at. So here's the first thing I want to show you in these, in these verses. Is the first thing you're going to see really clearly is that we want to be our own God. This is just part of being human. You might disagree. You might not put it in those words. You might not say, I've never once thought to myself when I woke up in the morning, you know, today I want to be God. We don't say it that way, but it's the way that we operate, right? We wake up and then we get to decide, do we want to do things the, the one true God's way or do we want to do things our way? And we have this sin nature in us that constantly says, I want to do things my way. That's our sin nature. We all want to do things our own way. We all want to be our own God, right? And Pharaoh acts a lot like a God. In fact, let me show you a few examples of this. In Exodus 5.2, when Moses says, let my people go, this is what Pharaoh says. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Here's one of the ways that it seems like, can you imagine saying something like that? Like, man, who's, who's God? I don't know this God that you speak of. I'm not going to let you go because I don't know this Lord, and I don't acknowledge him. But I want you to know that while it sounds really rough to hear Pharaoh say these words, these are the same thoughts that we think every time we act in our sin nature. Every time we do something outside of God's plan for our lives, what we're really saying is, eh, who is God to really know what's best for me in this situation? I'm going to do things my way. And then if you skip down to verse 10, just the first three verses, it says, in the KJV version, it says, thus saith Pharaoh. Uh, if you've spent a lot of time in the Bible or a little bit of time in the Bible, you've probably heard the phrase, thus saith the Lord. And now here's Pharaoh saying, I don't know who this Lord is that you're speaking of, but let me tell you, thus saith Pharaoh. I'm the one who calls the shots around here, is what Pharaoh is saying. Now again, it's really easy to say, wow, Pharaoh is way off of his rocker here. But the truth is, our sin nature in each of us, we do the same thing. Every day we say, you know what? God has one thing to say, but I'm going to go another way, thus saith Matt. You know, we, we say things like, I'm in charge of what's best for me. I get to decide my future. I'm going to make plans. My happiness is more important to me than anything else. And ultimately, when we start acting in that sin nature, right, what what happens is you start treating other people as just a utility to increase your own happiness. How can I use the people around me to get more of what I want? And that's essentially what Pharaoh is doing here in his sin nature, right? He's saying, listen, I, it doesn't serve my best interest to let these Israelite people go. In fact, now that they've even asked, I'm going to get more of what I want. And that's the sin nature in each of us. You see, people become a means to an end. And what Pharaoh essentially says is, get back to work. I'm not done using you for my own glory and my own purpose and my own happiness. And then in chapter 6, a real quick preview of chapter 6, God tells Moses, who by the way is 80 years old, we find out in chapter 6, 80 years old at this moment, he says, go back and ask Pharaoh again. And the Israelite people, you find out, aren't very happy. Moses says, listen, I'm going to go ask again. And they're like, please don't do that. The last time you asked, he made us work harder. And, and, and so the Israelite people are even struggling their own sin nature. They're not trusting God in this, and they don't want, they just want to end it. Here's the problem with this mentality. In Proverbs 16, 5, it says, the Lord detests the proud. They will surely be punished. So all of us in this room, right, when we... Whether we say it with our mouth or not, when we say, I want to be my own God, I want to do things my way, essentially the truth is that the Lord detests people who act and operate that way, and it says, they will surely be punished. Now, here you have Pharaoh. Pharaoh is acting in this way, and Pharaoh is surely 
about to be punished. So here's the second thing in this study of the human condition. Not only do we want to be our own God, but the other truth here is that there is only one true God. Now, here's the, when it comes to the human condition, when I say that there is only one true God, you have to understand that Moses knows that there's only one true God. The Israelites know that there's only one true God. And even Pharaoh, deep down inside, knows there's only one true God. I would, I would go as far to say as I believe deep down in the heart of every person. We were created in the image of God, and we know deep down inside that even if we want to be God, we are not. There is only one true God. And so there is only one true God, and God is going to use this next few chapters of Exodus to show off that there is only one true God. He's basically saying to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, listen, you think that you are a God, and now I'm going to show you that you are not. God is going to make it very clear that there is only one God between them. And he's going to use something that we call the plagues of Exodus to show who's really God and who's really not. So I'm going to, real quick, I'm going to walk you through these plagues and show you a few things and how God is highlighting the fact that he is God and Pharaoh is not, or that he is God and that you and I are not. Here's, here's how God accomplishes this. Let's look at the first nine plagues quickly. Number one is a plague that you're going to read about called the blood plague, right? In Exodus 1.17, it says, so this is what the Lord says. And don't miss this next part, right? I underlined it. It's not going to be underlined in your Bible, but why is God allowing these plagues to happen? Well, it says right there, I will show you that I am the Lord. Why is this plague even a thing? It's because God wants to show all of us who think that we are God or want to be God. He's showing Pharaoh, he's showing us, no, there's only one. I'm going to show that to you. He says, look, I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand, and the river will turn to blood. If you skip to verse 20, it says, the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died, and the water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. I don't know about you, but I was reading this passage one little weird thing stood out to me. It says, the water became so foul, right? The water has been turned to blood. That, that, that at some point, it became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it anymore. I guess that means at some point, they were willing to drink blood. I don't know. It's just gross, right? I, I, I don't know about you, but I am one of the, how many of you just the sight of blood and you get a little, a little weak, Anybody else like that? How many of you doctors and nurses that we really appreciate? How many nurses and doctors in here that you've handled blood really well? I really appreciate you. Because when it comes to any sort of something that's supposed to be on the inside of the body that comes out, I just don't handle it well. <laughs> right? And it says right here that there was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. Another thing to note is that the Nile was a, a body of water that was worshipped by the Egyptians. So for God to take this thing that was practically treated like a god, God's simply saying in this, listen, <laughs> Pharaoh, you're not God. This Nile that you worship, it's not God. And then he goes on to the second plague, which is the frogs. In Exodus 8, Verses 1 through 2, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. Now, I could go into greater detail on this one as well, um, but let me tell you why, another reason why he probably used frogs. In Egypt, there was a, a goddess of fertility named Heket. And if you have time, you can look up ancient Egyptian carvings of Heket, the goddess of fertility, and you're going to notice something, is that she has the head of a frog. 
Frogs, again, were a kind of a, a sign of, of a deity for the Egyptian people. And for God to say, listen, I'm going to take your Nile River and turn it into blood. I'm going to take this, this, these animals that, that, that represent one of your goddesses of fertility. And God is essentially right and left going through these plagues saying, listen, you've got all these gods. Pharaoh, you think you're a god? Listen, there is only one true God. And then it goes on. There's a third plague of gnats. And then there's a fourth plague of flies. In Exodus 8.21, it says, If you refuse, then I will send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people, and all the houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies, and the ground will be covered with them. Can you imagine? It says that you will be covered. The ground will be covered. I'm going to send these flies on you. And on your officials, when he, he literally means on. Like you're going to be covered in flies everywhere, your homes, everything. But notice that this, this, this fourth plague, this is the first time in all the, the plagues that God starts to separate the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, and the Egyptians. He says, listen, I'm going to send this fly plague on the Egyptian people. But on the, the Hebrew people in their homes, this is really the first recorded instance of what I call a no-fly zone. <laughs> All right? There was a no-fly zone in that, the Goshen, which is the area that the Hebrew slaves lived in. There was no flies there, but everyone else had to experience these flies. Plague number five, all, it says that the livestock were killed. It goes on again and says, uh, God says, I'm going to protect my people from this plague. So the livestock of the Egyptians are being killed with this plague, but not those of the Hebrew people. You know, one thing that's interesting here is you'll notice a change that happens in this plague. In the earlier plagues, you're going to notice as you read through this on your own that Pharaoh was calling magicians and sorcerers in to try to replicate the plagues. In other words, uh, we'll get to that in a minute why he did that, but the magicians would come in and say, what we're seeing here is the finger of God. Now, what happens here at plague number five is the magicians start changing their tone, and they're now saying what we're experiencing here is the hand of God. My grandmother growing up, whenever she would come into town, my parents would go out of town on a trip or something, my grandma would come into town to watch us, and she had a very interesting form of discipline. I've never seen anybody else do this, but my grandma, this was her thing, and I, I would call it uh, you know, uh, the flick, okay? If we, we were doing something we shouldn't do, grandma would warn us, and then she'd take her finger and flick us somewhere on the body. It, was, it hurt for a second, but it was like, ah, grandma, is that all you got? It was just a flick. We got basically, we didn't get the finger, you know what I mean? We, we, got, we got a finger. But my, my dad, on the other hand, his discipline strategy involved a hand, and it was a whole different version of discipline, right? Like, man, those spankings, those hurt. And so we can tell the difference between the finger of God and the hand of God. These plagues are getting worse, okay? And now the livestock is, is being killed. And then we go on to number six. I love that they included an adjective with this one, all right? We could have just said then there was the plague of boils. But if you look in the NLT, it says festering boils, I looked up the word festering in the dictionary for, if you're hungry, I'm going to ruin that, okay? <laughs> festering, here's what it means. Forming pus, rotten and offensive to the senses. So he brings on this plague onto the, the Egyptian people of these boils all over their body that are forming pus, they are rotten, they are offensive to the senses, they are incredibly painful, and then after the boils, we get to Exodus chapter 9. Remember, what is the purpose of all these plagues? Don't forget this, why I'm going through this. Is God is showing Pharaoh, you are not God, I am. Right, so after the boils, we get to this moment. Every time there's one of these plagues, Pharaoh gets an opportunity to let the people go. And he keeps saying no, right? And now we get to this, Exodus 9. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning. And stand before Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. 
Let my people go. Now don't miss, up until this point, every single time there's been a plague, Pharaoh has had an opportunity to let the people go, and he's continually been stubborn. It says that God has hardened his heart, or Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And then it says, so they can worship me. If you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Again, why all these plagues? Look at the underlined part again. It says, then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. What was the purpose of these plagues? It is so that God can say, Pharaoh, you don't understand. You don't get it. You still think that you and I are somehow on even playing fields here. You still think that you are a God. You still think that you're special. You still think you've got something that I don't. And God's saying, listen, I'm going to bring even more plagues on you so that you can learn finally, right, that there is no one like me in all of the earth. That is the purpose of this. And then it goes on in verse 15. It says, by now, I love how God throws this in there for Pharaoh. He says, by now, I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. But I have spared you for a purpose. God says, Pharaoh, I, I could have, you could not even be here to hear what I'm saying right now, but you're here for a moment and for a purpose, and here's why. To show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. This is essentially why God does everything that God does. When God pours out blessings, when God pours out uh, whatever he pours out, when God is working, the worries that he does, all the things that he does, is to make his name great and to make his fame known, and to make sure that people around this globe have an opportunity to realize that he is good, and he is God, and that he loves them, and essentially that's what he's doing here. The seventh plague is a plague of hail, and we've all probably experienced hail before. You've probably been outside and had little, like, little bits of ice, you know, bonky on the head, but if you read this, it says this, this kind of hail is the hail that would kill people, and animals, if it hits them. And then it goes on to say, it left Egypt in ruins. There was nothing really left. The hail was so big, kind of attacking the earth, this area like bullets. And then it goes on to this plague. And, and by the way, Pharaoh still says no. Plague number eight is the locusts. Now Pharaoh's officials are actually pleading with him. The officials that, that report to Pharaoh, they're coming up to Pharaoh saying, Pharaoh, Listen, we get it. You're in charge. You get to decide whether or not they come or go. But Egypt can't handle any more of this. And yet Pharaoh is still stubborn. His heart is still hardened. So the locusts come, and essentially the Bible says that they destroy everything else that's left. In Exodus 10, 2, it says, I've also done it. So you can tell your children and your grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them. So you will know that I am the Lord. And then comes this ninth plague called the plague of darkness. Try to read scripture from time to time in a way that you can actually, in a moment, like try to imagine what this would have felt like, all right? Here's what it says. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, lift your hand towards heaven and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. I don't even, I mean, I'm trying to even understand what that would be like to be in a place that is so dark that there is absolutely total voidness of light that you can actually feel the darkness. What's crazy is it says that there was still light, though, in Goshen, where the Israelite people lived. Just a spotlight beam of light that gave them all the light they needed. But outside of that little beam of light, total darkness. And yet still, Pharaoh says, no. In Exodus 10, verse 27, it says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more, and he would not let them go. Get out of here, Pharaoh shouted at Moses. Now you want to hear how Pharaoh thinks he's a god. Listen to what Pharaoh's about to say. 
Pharaoh still doesn't get it. He says, I'm warning you. Never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Pharaoh still has himself on the same level playing field as the one true God. And so Moses gives him a final warning. What we're going to call the tenth plague, also known as the Passover. And essentially what he says is tonight at midnight, because you still won't let my people go, because you still won't let God's people go, a spirit will pass over Egypt and all of the firstborn, not only of the humans, but of all the animals, the firstborn of every Egyptian is going to die. Pharaoh gets this warning ahead of time, and yet he continues to be an idiot. And we see this big idea of the plagues one more time, and here's the big idea of the plagues, and kind of our point number two is that there is only one God around here. God saying, Pharaoh, it's not you. You're not God. It's not the Nile. It's not frogs. It's not the goddess of Heket. And church, I want to make sure everybody in here knows it too. There's not a single God amongst us. I believe the one true God is present in this room, that he is fully present right now, but it's none of us in this room. And God has gone out of his way through these plagues to make this point very clear. God says, it is me, and I will make that very clear. God says that he is the one true God. So here's the, the number, number three. So remember, number one is that we want to be our own God. Number two is that there, but there's only one true God. Number three is that we stubbornly ignore number two because of number one. We do all agree that this is part of the human experience. If we all know that we want to do things our way because we have the sin nature, but we all also deeply know deep down inside that there is one true God. The problem is that we don't like the fact that there's one true God, so we ignore number two because of our sin nature and number one. We call this sin. Our sin nature struggles with this every day. My, you know, one clear example in my home, I've heard this multiple times from my children right? In, in your home, parents, there's, listen, there's still only one true God, right? But in your home, you, you're in charge, right? You get to call the shots. And sometimes my children don't like the rules over the home. They don't like what we're asking them to do or when they're supposed to be home or what, well, whatever. And I remember multiple times when they were really little, they would say, I can't wait till I grow up so I can be the boss, right? At the end of the day, we all want to be the boss. So we, we ignore number two so we can, because of number one. And we do the exact same things that Pharaoh does to be able to ignore number two because of his number one. I'll show you real quickly the, the few things I notice that Pharaoh does to be able to ignore that there's one true God. The first thing he does is he tries to explain away supernatural things so that he doesn't have to deal with them. He tries to explain away God-sized things so that he doesn't have to deal with the fact that there is a God and that he's not it. We see over and over again, Pharaoh, he invites magicians and sorcerers, right? Moses and Aaron will come in and they'll cause a plague to happen and then, then uh, the, the Pharaoh will call in his magicians and he's like, listen, could you guys also make water turn into blood? Could you guys also uh, somehow make frogs jump out of this Nile? Could you guys also... And for a, a little bit of time there, you're going to notice that the sorcerers using demonic power, that God allows them to be able to replicate some of these plagues. One thing you're going to notice, by the way, just a little free side note, is it's amazing how the magicians can replicate the chaos, but they can't stop it. They don't have the power to make the frogs get back in the Nile or to turn the blood back into water. Listen, Satan has the power to create chaos but only God has the power to take chaos and put it back into order. But he tries to replicate this, and every time his magicians and sorcerers are able to replicate one of these plagues, he essentially goes, ha, ah, see? God's nothing special. 
You know, we often take for granted the miracles we see in our life, don't we? There are things that happen all around us. In fact, I've heard people say before, well, God doesn't really do miracles anymore. And I understand what people are trying to say. They're trying to say, listen, in in the Bible, there's certain things that you see in the Bible that we haven't seen God do that miracle recently. But man, if you want just any clear evidence of God still being in the miracle business, Just visit a maternity ward for a second. Look at five fingers, five fingers, ten toes. Look at how everything has been put together, and it's a miracle that you're even breathing right now, that you're spinning however fast we are on this globe and going around the orbit, however fast that's all working, and everything just being held together. We have a miracle working God. And sometimes we like to minimize those things and not recognize them and ignore them so that we don't have to deal with the fact that there is a true God and that we're not it. Another thing that we see Pharaoh do to be able to to ignore that there's one true God is he minimizes, that we, we minimize our sin problems so that we can pretend they don't bother us. Let me show you one of the head scratching moments of Exodus chapter 8. This is something you might not have realized before. It was really interesting to read this, and I can't wait to read it for you. All right, you're going to scratch your head here. All right, Exodus chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. Here's what it says. It says, Pharaoh, remember the frogs? This is the frogs should just happen, right? There's frogs everywhere. There's frogs in Pharaoh's bed. There's frogs in Pharaoh's soup. There's frogs everywhere. And Pharaoh says, he summons Moses and Aaron and begs, plead with the Lord to take the frogs away from me and the people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. So he's, right now he seems to be at a place where he's going to let the people go after only the second plague, right? We know that he doesn't. We know because you've already read ahead that he's not going to let the people go, but it sounds like he's about to let the people go. And then Moses says this, you set the time, Moses replied. Tell me when you want me to pray for you, your officials and your people. Then you and your house will be rid of the frogs, and they will remain only in the Nile River. So get this situation. Frogs everywhere. Moses is, or the Pharaoh has had it. And he calls Moses and Aaron, and he says, please make these frogs go away. I'll do anything. I'll let you go. And Moses says, fine. Tell me when you want me to make the frogs disappear. And read the next verse, verse 10. Do it tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Listen, I've had moments where things have gotten into my house that my family doesn't want in the house, right? There's been a moment where you see that little little critter uh, run across the room and behind the refrigerator, right? And everybody sees it. Everybody knows there's a mouse behind the refrigerator. And ever, ever in my entire lifetime of this happening, it's happened probably three times over 20 years, have I ever said, all right, Melissa, I'll take care of it. When do you want me to get that mouse out of the house? She's never, ever said, do it tomorrow. (laughs) A weekly occurrence in my house is one of my daughters will see something with eight legs crawling on a wall somewhere, and never once have they ever said to just one little spider doing its own thing, minding its own business, have they ever said, Daddy, look at that. Can you take care of that? tomorrow. It's never happened. And yet here you have Pharaoh. He's got frogs everywhere. And Moses says, I can pray whenever you want to take it all away. And Pharaoh says, pray tomorrow. It doesn't make any sense. I think about it though, and think about this for a moment. We just, I know this isn't just me. This is a Part of the human condition. Every one of us in this room, we are guilty of this. We pretend like the results and the consequences of our sin aren't so bad so that we can say to ourselves, I listen, I know this is a problem in my life. I know this thing is causing a bunch of issues. I know this is causing a bunch of stress. I know this is a strain on my marriage. I know this isn't healthy for me. I know this. You know what? Oh, I'm going to take care of this. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the day I'm going to get this thing out of my life. Tomorrow is the day I'm going to stop doing that, watching that, looking at that, 
talking about that, saying that. You see, what we're doing is we're minimizing the consequences of our sin so we can pretend like it's not that big of a deal. Moses was just caught begging to make the frogs go away. And Moses says, all right. And the Pharaoh's like, oh, pff, it's not that big of a deal. Tomorrow's fine. Here's another thing that Pharaoh does to, to pretend like God isn't the only true God and that to ignore number one is letter C. It says, our desperation for help tends to go away as soon as we no longer feel the need for it. Have you noticed sometimes our prayer life only exists when we're desperate? When there's a real need in our life, then we'll go to God and we'll pray in those moments, God, I really need your help. But as soon as he does a powerful work, as soon as he brings relief, as soon as that, that thing is no longer there, it's just like we forget God is even part of it. We see this happening over and over again with the frogs, for example. Pharaoh says, make these frogs go away, Pharaoh, or Moses. And Moses says, all right. And the next day, he makes the frogs go away. And Pharaoh's like, oh, wait, there's no frogs anymore? All right, no, no, Israelites, you got to stay. You can't leave. I was going to let you go because of the frogs. But the frogs are gone, so you got to stay. I used to play this game. I don't know, have any of you ever played Canasta before? In high school, I had a couple of buddies. We'd get together and play canasta sometimes for a card night. And I, I don't remember exactly all the rules. It's been so long since I've played, but there's this, this word that's used in canasta. It's called uh, a renege, R-E-N-E-G-E. -E -E. I looked it up, and essentially in canasta, when you renege, it's essentially when you say you're going to do something, and you take it back. And Pharaoh, over and over again, does this. As soon as his desperation for help goes away, he changes his mind. And, and letter D, another way that we constantly ignore number two because of number one, is that we are just endlessly stubborn. Can we all agree to that? We are stubborn people. It says each time, I could go through, if you go through your scripture, kind of like an Easter egg hunt, you can find each of the times there's a plague, and then there's a moment at which Pharaoh says, no. And those, each time, sometimes it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Sometimes it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Sometimes it just says that his heart was hardened. And we're not really quite sure who's responsible. So the question is, who is it? Is Pharaoh hardening Pharaoh's heart? Or is God hardening Pharaoh's heart? And the answer to this is the same answer I give on Thanksgiving. When someone says, do you want a cherry pie or pumpkin pie or apple pie? The answer is yes. <laughs> right? You see, God is part of this process, but Pharaoh is part of this process, ultimately all for one purpose, so that God can make it really clear that he is the one true God. But there's a stubbornness that we all experience that Pharaoh we see in his own experience. So here's the, the number four of this human condition. It says, therefore, justice is necessary. So if there is a truth that all of us want to be our own God, but if it is also true that there is actually only one true God, and if our sin nature and our sin causes us to ignore number two because of number one, that the problem that that causes for each of us is that there's this, this sin problem requires justice. Somebody's got to pay for the times that we say, God, listen, I know deep down inside you're the one, but I'm going to ignore that today and do things my way because I want to be in charge. That requires justice. And one thing you're going to see as you go through these passages in Exodus 5 through 14 is that God's justice is very precise. He knows exactly what he's doing and why. He's kind of pushing the right buttons to make sure people know that the sin and the, the consequences of your, the way you've been treating my people, I'm now going to basically execute judgment, but it's going to be very specific in fact, in Exodus 12, 12, it says, I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. Notice the lowercase g. All the people who think they are a god. All the concepts and the things that I've created that you've turned into gods. All of those things, I'm going to execute judgment on those things. It says, for I am the Lord. 
And you're gonna see very direct blows. One very clear, I could show you in kind of each one of those examples, but we don't have time for that. So I'm gonna show you two really clear examples. One of the clear examples is really interesting, is in the festering boils plague, remember? Pus, smell, gross, pain, right? One of the things that we see how God brought about that plague is it says he had Moses take ash and dirt from underneath the brick kilns. Now this is where the the slaves would go to create bricks to be able to build Pharaoh's kingdom, right? They would go right in to this place where a Pharaoh is now asking you to work harder and to increase your output uh, or to keep your output of brick. Uh, I want you to go take that, that ash and I want you to take that ash. Not, you could go grab any dirt. He could have said, go grab some water. He could have said whatever. But he says, go to the place where they're really, really heavily burdening and impressing you under the, the yoke of slavery. And take that and throw it up in the air. And when it comes down, it'll cause festering boils. See how God is very, very clear and specific in how he's executing this judgment. But probably the best example of it is in the 10th plague which we haven't really talked about yet. Remember, he went to Pharaoh and says, listen, this is your last chance. If you don't let my people go tonight, the firstborn of all the people of Egypt will die. Notice this child for child, exact judgment. Remember Pharaoh, right, from, from a, a previous Pharaoh, but from, a, from the last little bit of passage that we read in, in last week, right? It was a, the Pharaoh saw that the Hebrew people were becoming too numerous and said, I want you to kill the Hebrew boys. Every time a boy is born, I want the boy killed. And now you have God giving an exact judgment, child for child. Pharaoh, if you don't let my people go, I'm gonna take the firstborn amongst you. So in Exodus 12, you see the rules for the Passover. Moses pauses for a moment. The Passover, the original Passover had already happened, so he's just writing the rules for how they're going to do Passover and why. And he explains how uh, essentially God says, listen, for, for all the Hebrew people, what you want to do before midnight comes, before the Passover, the 10th plague happens, I want you to take blood from, from a sacrificed lamb, and I want you to to put it on your doorposts on the, the left and the right and up top. And then when the Spirit of the Lord passes over the land, if your doorposts have the blood on the posts, the, the, the Spirit will pass over your home, and the firstborn in that home won't die. So he explains this to the, the Hebrew people, and they, they do that. In Exodus 12, verse 29, it says, And that night, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon, even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Here's here's something I want you to understand. Sin requires justice. It requires payment. There's judgment for the mistakes that we made. And the same is true for us today. Our sin, too, requires a perfect and precise judgment. Someone has to pay for our mistakes. And that leads us to this fifth Part, which I think is the good news part, number five, it says God's mercy is available to those who follow him. See, just as the Holy Spirit had given some rules for how, listen, if you paint the blood over here and you put blood over here and you put blood up here on your doorpost, that, there will be, that the Holy Spirit will pass over your home and you will be shown mercy. The firstborn of your home won't receive this judgment. You see, God's judgment passed over those who chose to follow him. The same today is true through Jesus Christ. Instead of the blood of an animal, I even love this this concept of the blood on the doorpost. You think of blood here and blood here and blood here, and it kind of paints a picture of a cross, doesn't it? 
And you recognize that no longer do we have access to the Holy Spirit uh, showing mercy to us through the Holy Spirit passing over uh, from this punishment, but we now experience the fact that each of us we're part of the human condition. We part, we're part of the sin nature. We all have the same issues of wanting to be God, but knowing there's only one true one and going about and sinning anyway and knowing that judgment is required. And yet somehow through following Jesus, we have access, not again, the blood of an animal no longer is what's gonna have the Holy Spirit pass over us, but it's now the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. We have access to mercy through Jesus Christ. I love how this story is such a beautiful picture of that. And yet Pharaoh is so proud that even after the Passover, he's now ready to let the people go. But notice who, <laughs> he's still so proud. He's going he's to let the people go. The, the death of his firstborn was more than he could handle, so it's finally time to go. But he takes credit. He makes it his call. He says in 1231, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. He's now making it his call. He's now making it his decision. It says the Egyptians gave the Israelites anything they asked for. As the, the Israelites are leaving, every time they'd go up to an Egyptian and say, give me all your gold, give me all your valuables, that the Egyptians were like, please, take whatever you want, just go. And it said, the Bible says, they, they stripped them of their wealth. Just like God said would happen in Genesis 15, when he said, remember, for 400 years you will be oppressed in slavery, but don't worry, I will get revenge, and you will be a country, a nation of great wealth, and I will strip those of wealth who were oppressing you. It says in 13, verse 21, the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And then Exodus 13 goes on for some rules for future Passovers, and we see the beginning of the Exodus that we're going to go through in the next five weeks. Let me give you just the next little part of that chapter 14, verses 15 to 18. Let's close with this. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Now, don't miss this, right? They've left the land of Egypt, and now they come to the Red Sea. There's a problem here. There's a sea in front of them, and they're supposed to be on the other side of it. And the Lord says this, Why are you crying out to me? It says, pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. So here we are at the Red Sea. Moses and Aaron put the staff, staff in the water. The sea splits. The Israelite people walk through on dry ground. And then it says the hearts of the Egyptians were again hardened, and they decided we don't, want, we don't like the fact they've left. So let's chase after them and get them back. And as soon as they walk into the water, the Red Sea collapses in on them. And God receives justice. The Israelite people receive mercy. And that leads us to our, our what now. Here's what I want to make sure everyone in this room knows. By the way, can I just thank you all for letting me go along today? <laughs> our, our worship team was gracious enough to cut a song because I said, listen, I got five pages of notes instead of four. Going from Exodus 5 through 14 is a big swath of passage to, to get through all at once. But here's what I want to make sure that everyone, maybe I was long-winded enough that you, you're not paying attention at the moment. So we just hear this one sentence, all right? See, God has promised a purpose and a plan and a path for all those who choose to follow him. 
And so for our what now, God, I wanna simply ask you, if you're in this room and you have not yet started a relationship with Jesus, listen, if you've already started a relationship with Jesus, your what now right now is just be in prayer for those that maybe haven't, all right? But for those of you who haven't made a decision to follow Christ yet, I wanna ask you to consider letting this be the morning that you access the mercy available to those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. You have access to the blood of Christ that Jesus died on the cross in your place and through that perfect once and for all sacrifice, though you deserve precise judgment, Jesus says, listen, I'm gonna take the judgment that was supposed to be on you and I'm gonna pay for it on the cross through my death. And now anybody who puts their faith in me One day, they're going to stand before God, and God is going to see the resume of Jesus Christ who lived a perfect, sinless life instead of yours. And I want to invite you to access that. In fact, after we're done closing with a song, if you want to give your life to Jesus today, I'm going to ask anyone in this room that's part of our prayer team maybe to just be near the front after service. And if you want to give your life to Christ, I want to invite you after we sing this song and service is closed or even during the song, if you'd like, just come up and tell someone, I want to give my life to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the, the fact that we get to see the entirety of the human condition in this story that we read today. We recognize that in this room, we are, we're full of that thing called a sin nature. We want to be our own God. But we recognize that you are the one true God. And though every day we, we fight that and we, we, we go against that, we recognize that your judgment is good and it's pure and it's right. But that simply through Jesus Christ, we have access to, to mercy. That you choose to pass over us in executing judgment because we put our faith and trust in following you. If there's anyone in this room this morning that needs to put their faith in you, I pray that you give them the courage today to not leave this place without making that decision. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, You can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.